Stephen Hall has been called an architectural poet. His designs have a visceral quality that appeal to the senses through light, texture, and shape. His proposal for the American Memorial Library in Berlin has been called a modernist masterpiece. His 1988 book, Anchoring, is one of the best-selling architecture books of all time. Some of his recent projects include an expansion of the Cranbrook Institute of Science in Michigan and the Museum of Contemporary Art in Helsinki, which won Finland's highest design award. I am pleased for those reasons and others to have him on this broadcast. Welcome. At long last, it's great to have you here. Yeah, let me talk about, about you a little bit. Tell me a little bit about where you place yourself in the world of architecture. Because I was having a conversation with a friend of mine who writes about architecture, and he said, you know, there is an interesting thing about you, which you are in part a classicist, you know, yet you work with shapes and ways that suggest, you know, other things that you always have, he said to me, a strong sense of proportionality. But above all, you know, no one understands and does better with light. Take that praise and put it in some context of where you see yourself. You know, <laughs> to see yourself, I think, is a little bit impossible. Uh, in a way, you are, you're doing your work, uh, you're thinking, you're trying to solve problems, and you're trying to simultaneously have a, an opinion in a, in a very complex, uh, changing world. And so I think one of the interesting things is you really don't, you really don't necessarily have an opinion of yourself you have to it's, in a way it's like someone rowing a boat you're, you're you're in a way going forward facing the past you can see what you've done yeah and uh, in, in recently uh, I've been uh, interrogated out in Ohio by Jeff Kipnis it's a little uh, a lecture series where you have to give two days intense everything you've done right and it's very interesting and uh, what came out of that experience I realized that I you know the work has been building up and the, uh, I realized how important it is to write as well as to to build and I've had I've been very lucky and I've had quite a few buildings for someone theoretically involved get yeah. built and uh, but I'm in the middle of writing a book right now called Elastic Horizons which is a reflecting moment and it's really a great one because one really starts to in a way have an opinion and have attitudes about the things that are swirling on around you and uh, I think this is very important for an architect to do to step back to take to take a longer view a larger view of everything that's changing the society you think you're a better architect this is an obvious question because you've taken time to teach taken time to absolutely. write treatises uh, taken time to you know, to pull back from just building oh absolutely I think you know the problem with a practice is it it's it consumes you. Uh, uh, buildings are very complex and they take enormous amounts of time and if you don't take a distance and reflect uh, you, 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 know, you really uh, you can get dull uh, as an architect and I think one of the exciting things is, is been able, what we've been able to do uh, with a few buildings and each one in a way is breaking new ground. I'm very excited about our, our, our recent work right now and I think in some ways I've just finally reached a kind of uh, momentum to be able to put some of the thought into the buildings. Before we look at some slides and, and talk about other things, someone said this to me, that you have this really remarkable way of working in which you work with watercolor renderings. Right. Right. That before you even think about architectural structure, that Space. you go into a room with a canvas, Watercolors. Well, it's not a canvas. It's a little little uh, watercolor pad, yeah. you know, that that I can fit on an airplane. Uh, and what do you do there? I'll have, uh, I'll, I'll be making conceptual sketches, but rather than just a dry diagram, they already have space and light. By the way, space is the the incredible media of architecture. You know, it's it's it's. I think if you have a if you have a, a intellectual idea, a verbal idea, and you have a spatial uh, equivalence simultaneously, you're really on the road to having a scheme. But without space, you really, you really don't have an idea. You can have an exterior form and, and in the end, you know, d d struggling to make an interior. And in the end, architecture, by the way, is decided when you walk into the building. Those are the places we inhabit, that we live in. I say that again, architecture? Well, you know, 
there, so many architects work from the outside in, and I really think that this is backwards, you know, because in the end, the feeling of the building, the, the experiential dimensions of space, like in our Kiasma Museum in Helsinki, uh, I was making watercolor drawings of the interiors before having an overall form on the exterior, or simultaneous to that. So this tool, this little tool, by the way, took a kind of supercharged dimension in 1991 when we computerized our office, and uh, we could scan my watercolors in, and you know, 10 people could be working on, on drawings that I would make on an airplane yeah. on the way from here or there. So that the computer has supercharged this little tool of the watercolor. It's not like a kind of a retro yeah. tool. Now, do now. you know anybody else that works like this, or is it? I think there have been in history a lot of people who work with watercolor. Right. I don't know if they've used them the way we do with with the computer, scanning them in and then, mm. you know, transforming them in ways that wasn't possible five years ago. All right, let's take a look at some of these. The first thing we're going to see is the Nelson Atkins Museum in Kansas City. Before I go into a conversation, of the things that you can build, we're going to see the Chapel of St. Ignatius in Seattle. Uh, we're going to see dormitories. We can. Uh, libraries and museums, public buildings, you know. What is it that you would most like to build? What kind of thing? Is there, I mean, do most architects now want to build museums? Do most architects want to build libraries? Do most architects want to build what? I'm, I'm, interested, any difference? I'm interested in a new challenge. You know, what's really exciting, you know, we've done a few museums. Uh, they're very exciting because they have this dimension of, of public space. Right. Um, I'm very enthusiastic about our dormitory at MIT, the chance to do a, a building that has to be, you know, it has to be tough, uh, but could be a catalyst to 350 incoming undergraduate students at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. That's very exciting. All right. It's that's a big challenge. We'll see that. So let's start with the Nelson Atkins Museum in Kansas City. We had, this is a concept of the project was to build an addition which would merge and organically connect the new spaces with the landscape in a way that complements existing 19, you can see it, 33, classical temple to art. Having said that, Stephen, talk about what I'm looking at. Well, this is a competition among six architects, and we were given, uh, in the brief, a very complex program, and uh, we were given a couple of months, uh, and uh, we were told that we must not intrude on the South Lawn. This is a great sculpture garden, this South yeah. Lawn. And uh, we were supposed to add on the, on the north in the parking lot, and uh, we felt that this was really wrong-headed, so we just took a risk, broke the rules, right. and uh, made the experience of the new addition really a new and a new museum that looks out onto the sculpture garden, that uh, involves itself in the sculpture garden, and these, these lights that are coming up out of the landscape are supported by breathing T's, which yeah. unify structure, HVAC, and uh, one of the nice things, they're, they're not pure, they're impure. There, some have cafes, one has offices in it. So it, what looks like a pure, a purest composition is very impure. I mean, one of the excitements I, I have is, 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 is thinking about how architecture is changing and uh, keeping up with science and, and thinking how, how, the, how does that affect what we make and how we make it. Is architecture changing primarily in terms of the tools you have to work with or some intellectual breakthrough or what? All those things. It's changing because of the tools, but I think the way we think and feel uh, uh, is bound to be something, uh, a changing ground. I mean, one of, the, one of the things about this book I'm writing, Elastic Horizons, is, is, is just thinking about our world today and how uh, developments such as this, the Hubble telescope and mm -hmm. you know, the view of, of the, the understanding of time, the understanding of you know, let's say the confusion of the beginning of the universe. All these things have, have uh, impact on the way we make space, the way we think about space, and uh, the way we feel about space. And I think one of the excitements about this project is that we could take such a radical approach and get a unanimous support from the jury and a unanimous vote from the trustees. So we could break the rules, we could go out of the box, we could merge with the landscape, and, and provide a, a project, I think, that's going to be a very exciting mm -hmm. one for the public. What kind of instructions did you have from the jury? Uh, it was a very large program. Oh. You know, there's a very, very, you know, technical yeah, right. okay. series of galleries that have to be 
uh, parking, which we provide under uh, a reflecting pond right. to the north. All right, roll tape. Let me, let me see the next one slide. Wow. So when you arrive now, you will arrive in a, in a forecourt that has a reflecting pond, and you can see those lenses bring light to a parking level down below. This museum is, is, is in a way, the Metropolitan Museum of the Midwest. In the, middle, in the middle of America, people come from 200 mile radius, maybe larger, and they drive. So the arrival moment sometimes is a parking garage. So we made a very inspiring parking garage right. with glass lenses in the uh, pond that bring light down below. Now there's two, there'll be two entrances, one to the left for the, for the main uh, museum experience, but to the right one can have a black tie entrance in the existing museum and you can imagine on a Sunday afternoon when people are leaving the museum, a black tie event is going on. They can be coming out and going in in two different ways. Okay, the next one is the MIT residence we mentioned earlier, 350 bed dormitory with a dining hall auditorium and other shared facility. We, we, we started this project with criticizing their master plan. They had on Vassar Street a brick Boston, yeah. you know, sort of uh, wall in the master plan, you know, uh, legislated, uh, wasn't, wasn't really made a, 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 a rule. And I said in the interview, I said, you know, the first thing I'm going to do is throw out your master plan. Yeah. I thought that would offend them. And, uh, but it didn't. I came with a sketch the next morning and I said, you know, you really need to think about porosity, about uh, letting Cambridgeport see through this wall yeah. and see the, 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 the Charles River. Right. You need to think about how you could have a different approach. And that whole strip along Vassar Street could be porous. So then we came up with a number, like four different buildings which were porous. Right. And uh, this was one of them, which and, is and, a, and, was a kind of sponge yeah. all over porous, and uh, there's a number of openings that have public space, yes. but every room has nine windows. Every dormitory room will have nine windows, two, inch, two feet, two inches square, all of which open. So imagine, you know, I mean, one of the great luxuries that you can offer today as an architect, you don't get fine detail, you don't get great uh, construction, but you can offer space, inspired space. And when you're in a dormitory room, you know, you're, you're just there, you're studying, to have this wonderful feeling of, and it's a little, we had to make the ceilings a little bit higher, nine foot two inches from floor to ceiling. Mm -hmm. And uh, each, each of these windows opens so that the students will have natural ventilation. And, and by putting the structure in the outer wall, we also get a natural brie soleil. For example, the summer sun doesn't go into the room, the winter sun goes into the room uh, because of the angle due to the depth well, of the What facade. happens to the summer sun? How it's is it reflected? It's blocked because of the uh, depth of the facade. So, oh. In, in those smaller windows, it's a natural shading device. It's, a, it's like a passive solar wall, if right. you will. Uh, next one is the Cranbrook Institute of Science, Bloomfield Hills, uh, winner of the 1995 AIA Design Award. Now, what is so great about this? I don't... The project was an ex extension of Eliel Saarinen's 1937 building, which yeah. was a U-shaped building. And our addition yeah. was uh, uh, based on the concept of a strange attractor, the idea of multiple routes through space, a science concept uh, developed by Edward Lawrence in 1963. So to, to, to make these multiple routes, we, we, we just touch the existing building, and then there are, are numerous ways that one can program the new space. Is part of the challenge when you are doing something like this, an extension of it, a Saarinen project, or, or even in the case of, of uh, the Nelson Atkins Museum, you gotta make sure that whatever you design complements and doesn't overshadow, overshadow. I think about this in terms of what happened at the Guggenheim and all that. You know, you know right. the, you've got to have a reverence for what's there. Well, if the building is strong, and in the case of Cranbrook, the campus is very strong. And, uh, but in, in some ways, we extended that building. It had two dead-end corridors, two galleries, the Hall of Minerals right. and the Hall of Man. So we blew them out in a way and, and, and made this into a new, and a new complex. All right, let's see another picture of this. We've got a new <laughs> That's four. That's the, the light laboratory where we made different kinds of glass uh, show natural phenomena of light. It changes every day. Every day is different in that room, and uh, it's a natural exhibit. It's uh, sun projected. Next slide. And this is the Garden of Science in which we uh, invent, envisioned uh, exhibits called the story of water, water, liquid, solid, right. and vapor. Hmm. Um, all right, next slide. And this is below the uh, liquid passage where one sees the dancing of water in sunlight. It's interesting That's that nice, these yeah. three things were not part of our program. They were things that we imagined, and they were funded first. 
In other words, they, they gave us a brief for a science museum. We imagined the story of water with a house of vapor and a house <laughs> yeah. of ice. Yeah. And it so inspired the donors that those things were funded first. The house of vapor, the house of ice, and the light laboratory were the first things that were funded for the museum. Uh, all right, uh, next slide. This is the Museum uh, of Contemporary Art in Helsinki, right. which a competition we won in. What, 93? Yeah, and, and it opened in 98. Yeah, and they got an award, National AIA Design Award, 1999. Um, tell me about it. The, bi the building is based on the intertwining of, of, of two body parts of the building. You can see uh, a, a kind of chiasmatic intertwining, which relates to the light, the horizontal light in Helsinki never reaches above 51 degrees, and therefore the sort of right side there in the slide mm -hmm. you can see is like a catcher's mitt mm -hmm. bringing the light into the galleries. Mm -hmm. It also relates to the urban plan and the landscape in the distance which I'm happy to say that the landscape park will be something that they were going to realize in the future, which extends all the way to Alto's Finlandia Hall. Next one, next slide, the same, same building. So you can see the, the, the space uh, at the entranceway and how one uh, is drawn up into the sequence of galleries. There are 25 galleries, all of which have natural light. And then the part of what you're doing here, is, as you've said, having to do with looking at the building from the inside out, but as you are also looking for some kind of strong appeal to the senses, right? Using the light and the space, absolutely, to to I grab mean, the sense. The of real measure of architecture is when you walk with your body through it. And, <laughs> yeah. And if you experience a number of different uh, spatial configurations, I call it a sequence of overlapping perspectives. It's a, it's it's a completely different experience than a series of you know just one big space or a series of. And in this particular building. There's no way to show this in photographs. Mm -hmm. you, you can only experience right. no, this I know, I know. walking through it. Like a, I said, 25 galleries. The last gallery is, is a kind of a crescendo in a musical composition. You have a, a kind of row and a retrograde row that's played. You can't really understand it until you reach the last gallery, what was going on, how it was building up, and how the sort of release occurs. In terms of an architect's work, it's, uh, it's very frustrating that Architecture really is just published in magazines. You see these. No, it really it is. Or and it's warped by these wide, ang wide angle lenses to totally distort what the yeah. space is. Right. The, um, when did you start using curved shapes? Is that for a while? It's, I think I've used curved shapes, I've used uh, orthogonal shapes. I've used, depends on the concept. I think every site and circumstance is a unique opportunity, and, and architecture can be inspired by anything. Uh, in this case, intertwining or a building folding in on itself really required the curved surfaces. And by the way, the doubly warped wall, the doubly warped curve in that wall was not easy to build. That was, <laughs> What's the material? That's a reglet, insulated glass plank. So it's structural glass that spans nine meters, and it's a ruled surface as it moves along a wall that starts at nine and a half degrees and turns into a nine and a half degrees tilt in the other direction. Next slide. There again. That's that upper gallery you arrive at, and yeah. just behind that fold you see out to Tolon Monte Bay. Okay, now the Chapel of St. Ignatius. This project also started with a Your brief hometown. in my hometown, and uh, we were given the charge to make this chapel, and uh, we decided that we needed to tra transform the center of the campus, so we, we sited it right on a former street in the middle of the campus, therefore making what was once a kind of asphalt residual grid into a campus space. And we wanted uh, the sequence uh, to include what I call a thinking field, this pond of just two inches of water, which forms a kind of campus place of reflection. And now, it, now when, did, when did you do this? This was, it was designed in 1996, and, and it opened in 1995 and 1996, and opened in spring of 97. How many, how many designs have you done in which you won the competition and the building was never completed, never done. I mean, like, is it 15? No, it's, I think the ratio is 1 to 25, you know, efforts you know, to it's something that's built. It's completed. Yeah. 1 I mean, to 25. 1 to 25. I would drive me nuts. Well, it would. But all what, that energy. Charlie, what you don't realize, though, is when you finally get to realize the space, yeah. it's so charged. And it's there. I mean, I, you know, one of the things that... What do you mean I, it's there? In other words, well, the one example, that you complete? This chapel, for example, doesn't just communicate to architects. It communicates to people on campus. And, and I get emails and letters and, and, and 
and people taking their first grade class in there and making sketches and sending me back the sketches. I was in Seattle a sort of two months after it opened and I was buying something in a grocery store about 10 blocks from here. And I used my credit card and she says, oh, you're an architect. You've got to go up and see that chapel up there at the university. Uh, I didn't know. You know, I yeah, mean, this kind, of, this kind of dimension, which cuts across, you know, the academic yeah. uh, stuffiness. It cuts across the, the sort of political problems of architects, you know, control factors. That once you put a building down, it's an inspired space. It somehow has another life. And to realize just one of those, and by the way, Pierre Chirot... Yeah. Only built a couple of buildings. I, know. I don't think you have to build so I many. Hear you. I hear you, but I mean, I, I know that's true. And I, and I know that I've talked to actors before who have said to me, ah, oh, you get a great role once every 10 years. That's it. You know, I mean, I still enjoy the other things. It's fun. I'm using my talent, but a great role comes along. Very yeah. rarely. Yeah, that's you true. Know? And it takes a great client. The client has to really well, speaking of that, desire architecture. Yeah. You know, were you, did you, was there a competition for Bill Gates' house or not? No. No. It, <laughs> what does that mean, no? I mean, you're a Seattle person. I would have thought uh, you'd been in there lobbying hard. To, no. Well, I, I think Is there a story here that I don't know or should know? Well, I really don't think it's much of a house. I mean, it yeah. could have been something, but I think it's a very ameliorating exterior. $75 million. I'd like to see you know, sort of 70 million of that going to public work, personally. <laughs> I, I, you know, one of the things that's happening in America now is the, is the you know, the overly large house. Yes. And uh, I think it's a very difficult com uh, commission. We're turning them down because Are you it's, really? it's difficult. Because, I mean, you got the point, you're at the reputation I, I, I now believe, where people want you I to do. believe you can only do so many buildings in your life anyway, that right. with, with great intensity. And... Uh, I'd much rather do dorm dormitories for 350 students that are coming into MIT than a 20,000 square foot house for so many million. I think it's, uh, you know, you have to just question why. Yeah, why but at some point you want to do one great house. Well, we've, we've made a house in Dallas, which I really feel is, is a great house. That's the, the, str the Stretto house uh, yeah. uh, 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 in Dallas, Texas. So which, you've done your one great house then? No, I, 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 I think I have a few more in me. <laughs> All right. But, but, I mean, it would just be very frustrating for me to go because it's, you know, so much of your time goes into and passion and intensity. Right. And all of a sudden, for whatever reason, beyond the architect's brilliance, uh, it doesn't get built. Funds, conflicts, blah, 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 blah. Right? Absolutely. I mean, that would just be, you know. Um, okay, let's take another look at this chapel because this is pretty good. What's this? Inside, uh, all the fixtures and furniture were designed by us but executed by local craftsmen so we we found uh, uh, a steel maker glass blowers oh, plasterers yeah. it's yeah. it's you know that the crafts are still alive you know if you if you have a chance of getting a building that you can use them everything doesn't have to be sheetrock and aluminum windows in this world you know you know the concept for this building is uh, seven bottles of light in a stone box and they refer it refers it's a kind of double entendre yeah. it refers to the to the uh, the fact that there's 60 different nationalities in this university and therefore they're all kind of coming together in mm. one collective place. Right. It also refers to the liturgical aspects of the Jesuits. But we made each one a different color and you can see here uh, a, a kind of green field with a red lens. And you can actually tell the time of day and the time of year in, in these bottles of light. Is this a good time for architecture? I think it's a very interesting time for architecture. I think one of the, one of the things that's happened is uh, you know, at, at, at the sort of uh, middle of the century, modernism, in a way, became a little dry, a little methodical, and uh, we produced, architects produced some rather banal buildings. And, uh, of course, we had the reactionary period of most postmodernism. Post right? it, had, it had to happen, but it, it probably produced much worse in the end. I think the toll <laughs> still needs to be taken. In other words, in other words the, uh, and the end result of postmodernism was worse than modernism. I, I, I think pe yeah. most people would agree with that yeah. if you look around America, especially America. So, uh, Europe, Europe didn't succumb to the, to yeah. the whims. And I think what's really exciting now is, in a way, we've, we, we have a clearer slate. We have uh, technology that allows us to do some things that the craftsmen that aren't there, you know, it, in a way it makes up for it. And... Uh, and uh, there's a chance to build great public space again. And I think we're seeing the, the, the sort of aspiration to do that. And that's the, that's the great things, uh, I think, that 
can happen. Wait, with well, you're saying that, that there's a chance to do it because what? Because there's a demand for the buildings? There's also the will, I think, that in, in the, on the part of clients to not really recreate or repeat a, a, a sort of uh, a bad version of some historical idea, but to allow uh, the possibility that with architectural inspiration that we could make something fresh and new and of our time. And we always, in a way, are of our time. So the, the excitement today is, for the first time in 25 years, I think we see clients who are willing to take that chance and to go forward. And uh, at the Nelson Atkins Museum, I think that's something that we were totally surprised to receive a kind of unanimous support on their behalf uh, uh, on what I thought was a conservative client to do something which I think will be a great uh, public place there in Kansas City. Is Berlin the most exciting city architecturally today because of stuff that's going on? For me, Berlin's a big disappointment. Mm -hmm. I think you mean they dropped the ball? Sort of I thing? think what happened, uh, uh, what could have happened and what's happened uh, are so far apart that uh, I, I was there last year and, and uh, I, you know, I think, I think uh, you know, what could have happened is, is, is really something amazing. I think there were too many constraints. Um, and it was, they were bad, was this because were of reunification and, and all of that? No, I mean, I, for example, the whole building out of Friedrichstrasse could have occurred in a different way. The whole, uh, the whole building out of Unter den Linden could have occurred in a different way. Um, I think the constraints were too narrow. Uh, the idea of, of, of urbanism was too narrow. Now they realize that, and, and there's some more opening up. There's some, some interesting things happen. Um, but I think that there could, have been a, there could have been something really fascinating. And uh, I think it's rather commercial and rather banal. Mm. And finally, the much talk about um, Bilbao. Important for architecture because of all the... Yes. I, you know, we were there uh, over the summer, and I had seen... Uh, I had seen so many photographs of it, and of course, I know Frank and, and love him, as everyone does. And this building truly transformed that city. I'd, I'd been in Bilbao before, giving a lecture before that building uh, was there. I knew what, what the site, I knew where it was going to be built, and it was just a mud flat, you know, with some sort of container cargo things down there. So what he really did was an urban spectacle, like Sagrada Familia in yeah. Barcelona. Yeah. I mean, in a, in a way, it's, it's that. Uh, but for it, an art museum, that's something else. I mean, one, I, 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 I saw, for example, Torqued ellipses over here at the Dia Art Foundation. Richard Serra's great uh, recent work. Uh, there were uh, there were three of them, oh, and no, then no. when they installed uh -huh. them in Bilbao in that overly gigantic room, right. they looked like tables in a room. So <laughs> not as imposing. No, and so one has a problem with the space for art. I think. Well, that's but just that one room. No, that's just one room. That's right. room. And what it does for the city is in incredible, yeah. and what it what it does just for the the, the sort of idea, the hope yeah. that we can make. Interesting That's architecture it, it, that we... It, it, it's an amazing... It really is. It's an amazing I mean, what it did for the city is amazing. Yeah. And it also, you know, I mean, it, what it says, it, 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 maybe it is an urban spectacle, but what it says, and you hope, and other buildings do this, is just that this one sort of galvanized so much right. attention because of it, it, what it did for the city. What you, ho what you hope it says, in addition, is a kind of respect for architecture as well. Right. You know, right. As a catalyst. As a catalyst. As an urban catalyst. Yeah. And I think right. that's, that's something that's very positive and, and should go on and can go on in our near future. Stephen Hall, thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.